So the Neuro-Oncology Committee is really tight-knit, which I'm sure is a nice thing for you guys to know. Um, you know, we talk to each other, we refer to each other. We're doing a little tour of Sydney today. So we've started at Eastern Sydney with Jacob, moved to North with Michael, and now we're moving to Western Sydney. So I'm, I'm welcoming Dr. Net Toniella, who's a very esteemed medical oncologist. She's the director of the MacArthur Cancer Therapy Centre out at Campbelltown, which is one of the most dynamic and exciting cancer centres in Australia. And she's a member of COGNO, the Neuro-Oncology Group's Scientific Advisory Committee, and she's a keen trialist and clinician. Please make Annette very welcome. Great. Um, so I'm a medical oncologist and I'm usually the third person down the, the group. So first of all, you see your surgeon and surgeons are, I still think, the most important because getting as much of that tumour out as possible and preserving function is critical. And then uh, second is usually the radiation oncologist. And then finally, you see the medical oncologist, the one who prescribes chemotherapy. And as a medical oncologist, we see patients who have tumours that are grade two and above, so grade two, three, and four. So today I'd like to just talk about what we do and chemotherapy and also look at the future and what potential uh, trials are available. And I apologise because I've been told I've got quite complex slides, but hopefully I can try and simplify these and in a way that provides information and also hope for the future. So as I said, we get involved for, with grade two um, tumours. And this particular study enrolled people with what we call high risk grade, tumors, grade two gliomas. And back when this study was conducted, we didn't have the benefit of molecular profiling, which we now do. And so the pathologist would tell us this is an astrocytoma, a oligodendroglioma or a mixture. And so in this study, which enrolled high-risk um, grade two gliomas, what we can see is that by giving chemotherapy, and um, PCV chemotherapy is quite a toxic regimen of oral tablets as well as IV drugs, we improved survival. It doubled. So just by giving chemotherapy in addition to radiotherapy, there was a doubling of survival from seven years to 13 years. In another group, and this is a group of, and so we still give this chemotherapy today, the one that I just spoke about, PCV, to a group of patients that have the 1P19Q um, co-deletion. But for those that don't have that specific mutation and have low-grade gliomas, this is another potential option. And so in this study, and it was a big study, it enrolled 751 participants, we looked at whether giving chemotherapy with radiation improved outcomes. It, we also looked at whether giving radiation followed by chemotherapy, and this is using the drug Temidal, an oral tablet for 12 months, improved outcomes, or whether you need to give chemotherapy with radiation and then chemotherapy after radiation. And what this, this study showed is that for these type of tumours, giving chemotherapy with radiation at the same time did not improve survival, but when you give it after radiation, it did. So it guides what sort of treatments we give in these low-grade gliomas. Sadly, and I think somewhat soberingly, we have a fairly small armamentarium of drugs available for gliomas. And we can see that really um, this is the space where we need to grow. And so I'm going to talk for now about high-grade gliomas. And I think many of you in the audience will be familiar with this. And this is what we call the Stuck Protocol. It was now 19 years since this study was reported. And what it showed is that after surgery for a high-grade glioma or GBM, people who then went on to receive radiotherapy with chemotherapy, followed by more chemotherapy, lived longer when they got chemotherapy. And that benefit, sadly, is quite modest. So the average survival is 14.6 months using that regimen compared to 12 months with radiation alone. However, there was a doubling in survival. So 20% of people were alive at two years compared to only 10% with radiotherapy alone. So there is a benefit. And I think things are also improving. 
So when we look at um, chemotherapy, we often say, OK, if we give one drug, that's great. What if we add a second drug? Are we going to improve outcomes even further? And so that was done in this trial where we added lomustine to, chemo uh, to temozolomide chemotherapy. And although it looks like there may be a benefit, sadly, this was a negative study. Um, so even though the median survival was 38 months for those who received the combination compared to 31 months, it wasn't what we call statistically significant. So we can't be confident that these results aren't just due to chance as opposed to the drug itself. Um, nevertheless, I think what is heartening to see is when we look at the median survival from the STUP study, which was about 14 months, we're now seeing people living 31 months in this group. So that's an improvement in the last 14 years, which is when this study was reported in 2019. But chemotherapy has its side effects. So nausea and vomiting are quite common, but I must say in the last 10 or so years, we've certainly improved the way that we treat and manage these side effects, but they're not to be ignored. There's also risk with low blood counts, people coming in with infections, with nosebleeds, with increased bleeding risk due to low platelet counts, and these need to be managed and managed carefully. Sadly, when it comes to GBM, we also know that most tumours recur. And so far, the drugs that we have in this setting, and one of the drugs that's been mentioned is called Bevacizumab or Avastin, which works against blood vessels, have been shown to delay the time that to the cancer getting worse, but unfortunately haven't extended the survival time. So I think there is still a lot of work to be done in this space. So why is it so hard to really make big changes in glioblastoma? And I think it comes down to a number of factors. So when surgeons resect a tumour, and sometimes they're only able to do a biopsy in order to preserve people's function, they only take a snapshot of the tumour. And we know that when tumours recur, they recur in the area that's left behind. And potentially what's left behind is dif may be different to what has been removed. And we also don't know precisely how well what's left behind interacts with the other normal brain cells and what influence that has on tumour growth. And I think understanding that better is critical. Tumours are also heterogeneous, meaning that different areas of the tumour will have different aspects or changes or mutations to other aspects. And so trying to target those is quite tricky. We need to also ensure that drugs get into the brain. And so our bodies have a blood-brain barrier which limits toxins getting to the brain, but it can also make getting drugs to the brain quite challenging. And when we do, do trials in this space, we really need to understand where we don't have successful trials, why weren't they successful, and really interrogate that so we can always learn from that. I think, um, just very briefly touching on pathology, I think this is really critical. So in 2021, um, we moved away from the slide that uh, Jacob put up, which is still confusing, but we are understanding tumours better in terms of molecular profiling. And so people like Dr Rodriguez, who's able to work out what mutations are associated or what molecular alterations are seen in tumours, this is important because it then allows us to give treatments that are appropriate for that type of tumour, but it also potentially opens up options for treatment in the future. And so now I want to move on to, well, what does that future look like? And I'm going to talk a little bit about precision oncology and also touch on immunotherapy. So precision oncology or targeted therapies are really trying to identify what is unique to the brain tumour cell and what do they have which is different to normal cells and trying to develop drugs or mechanisms to target those changes and eliminate those cells so that we can get rid of tumour cells. And there has been some progress in this area. 
So the way that this has been, so identifying those changes or mutations has really um, been revolutionised in the last 20 years. So back in 2000, we were just starting to understand how to um, interrogate um, cell DNA. But now, fast forward to 2018-19, they it is possible to do very um, technical interrogation of cancer cells so that we can identify very small mutations, and this is done relatively quickly. What I think, and the take-home message I think from my talk is this, it's really important that you ask your medical oncologists about molecular profiling of tumours. So previously there was what we called the MOST program, which was run out of the Garvin Institute, and it was excellent. Um, and it helps to potentially identify, is there a target in, your, in a tumour which then will enable treatments directed against that target and possibility of going on to trials. The MOST program was excellent. However, in order to be referred to that, you had to have gone through all standard lines of therapy. So we were offering it quite late. And these results often take two to three months to come back. And so by that time, circumstances may have changed. So now we can actually refer much earlier through this cancer screening program, again run through the Garvin, um, and we can do it even at diagnosis. So getting answers earlier, I think, is important. Although it holds a lot of promise, uh, GBM is still a cancer for which there are limited molecular mutations identified. So it may not provide all the answers, but I think that it potentially may open up uh, opportunities. And I was quite sobered to hear this week that a colleague of mine presented a case where a patient had a CDK46 mutation identified. That's a very specific um, mutation. There was a trial available that the patient was referred to, and the patient actually had a very good long-term outcome by going on a specific drug. So unfortunately, as you can see from the numbers, only about 2.5% of patients, there might be small numbers that have these mutations, but we won't know about them unless we look for them. And so I'll just briefly talk about um, a couple of these. So this was a study called, looking at a drug called larotrectinib, and I struggle to say some of these names. And that's looking for, um, that's targeted against NTRAC mutations. It included patients, so this was, these were early phase trials, but they included patients with brain tumours, both low grade and high grade tumours. And they in this group of patients that were treated with targeted therapy, one in three had a response to treatment. Similarly, there was another trial looking, and this was called the RAW study, hence the line, and it was looking for a V600E mutation. These are commonly seen in melanoma, but in low-grade gliomas, they occur in 5 to 15% of cases. In high-grade gliomas, about 3%. And this was using a combination of drugs, again used in melanoma, called dibrafenib and trimetinib. And it showed that using that combination, one in three people with high-grade gliomas had a response, and two in three with low-grade gliomas had a response. So that has led to the FDA approving these drugs. But if someone were to be identified with this kind of mutation, the first thing I would do is ask, is there a trial available that this person can go on? Another mutation that's been identified is IDH. And IDH as is um, quite frequently seen in low-grade gliomas. And last year, um, data was published on vorocetinib, which is an IDH inhibitor. This drug, we expect, may become available, potentially on compassionate access. It's not available yet but it has been shown to dramatically improve progression-free survival from 11 months for people who receive placebo to 27 months for those that receive these drugs. So I think things are improving. However, in terms of access, I think it will be very much restricted to those that fit what the types of patients that were included in these trials. 
And I guess more closely to home, we actually already have studies looking at these IDH1 mutated tumours, and this is the LUMOS2 trial, and I'm sure um, Dr Coe will expand on this further. But for those that have recurrent gliomas, um, they will need to undergo surgery, and then based on molecular profiling of their tumours, will be assigned to different treatments, um, which will be targeted treatments. I'll very briefly talk about immune strategies, and I think this is really still quite a way in the future. So there are trials underway um, in a lot of areas, a number of which are conducted overseas, but this may be something that we see more and more in the future. So some of these studies have been in vaccines, and there have been about 20 studies looking at vaccines in brain tumours. Um, Rindipepimet was a study that was conducted, including in Australia, and unfortunately didn't prove to be a, a game-changer in terms of survival. But the newer drugs, which um, some of which are listed there, are currently in phase one and two studies, and I think are ones to watch for the future. Um, at this stage, I think they're predominantly being conducted in the US, but potentially, if they are showing benefit, we may hope that they'll come to Australia. I'll talk briefly about checkpoint inhibitors because these are a bit of a buzzword. So what do these do? So basically our immune systems are tightly regulated so our body's cells don't attack each other. But our immune system should go and fight foreign cells or cancer cells. But our cancer cells hide under like an invisibility cloak. They're, the immune system can't see them. What these drugs do is remove the invisibility cloak and say to our immune system, go and fight those cancer cells. They're not targeted and they just cause an immune response. But in many cancers, um, checkpoint inhibitors have been a game changer. So melanoma, it's revolutionised treatment. We're also using these drugs in lung cancer and a variety of other cancers. In brain tumours, we've seen some benefit, uh, sorry, these drugs have been tested, and what we've found is just using one drug, uh, one checkpoint inhibitor, really hasn't shown a benefit yet. But potentially using these drugs before surgery may be an option of treatment in the future, and there was a study in 2019 that showed some promise, and I think that's moving into more advanced um, uh, studies. Maybe using one drug isn't enough and we need to use combinations. So using these drugs together with vaccines, radiation, I think are still areas that are being explored and I think are very important. I really just briefly mentioned that there are other strategies using immune therapy that are being tested. Um, CAR T cells are ways of basically isolating blood from a patient then taking out the T cells and re-injecting those T cells after they've been modified to go and find cancer cells. There's been a lot of work in this area and it's shown benefit in lymphoma. Um, so far, not so much in brain cancer, but there is a trial in Adelaide looking at potentially using this technology. So it's a watch this space. And we've also looked at using viruses, so putting viruses, infecting cells with viruses, which then go and target infected cancer cells. So again, trials in this area, but these are still very early stage. So what do we have currently available to us? So probably one of the key studies is GBM Agile. It's open at four sites in, New, uh, in Australia, um, two in New South Wales, uh, Royal North Shore being the closest. And this is using a different type of study um, design and looking at using drugs early and, um, and initially so the drugs that are being used are really being tested for the first time in humans. But um, we're hoping that using this design we can get answers faster than we see with our traditional study designs. Uh, the MAGMA trial, I'll leave to Dr Ko to talk about a bit further, but it's a study that has been completed. So one of the things I will say is when we do studies in Australia, we do them, we do them well, and we recruit very well to studies. And we always ask um, whenever we see patient, 
patients, and I think it's a really important question as a patient and a carer to ask your oncologist, are there any trials available for me at multiple journey points? So in conclusion, I think we really do need new therapies, and I th I'm encouraged that there are a number of trials underway, which um, hopefully will lead to better outcomes. It's always important to consider trials, including early phase trials, particularly if a target is identified. We need to make trials accessible though. So for people that live in regional areas or rural areas, getting onto a trial is much more challenging and I think that's something that we as a group need to work better towards. And as um, Jacob really highlighted, looking after people with brain tumours is a multidisciplinary approach. We have multiple members of the team, but really key at the heart of it are patients and their families. And I'll, I'll just finish with this slide. So I, um, as a medical oncologist, I remember back in 2011 when I was training that melanoma was a, a um, people with advanced melanoma had very poor outcomes. Fast forward five years later, and immunotherapy has been a game changer for um, melanoma treatment. And I truly believe that with glioblastoma and brain tumours, that we are going to have our melanoma moment, and perhaps these are the people that are going to help us achieve that.